Yo, what's up guys? Betty here, and today I'm looking at the decks from the top 64 qualifier. This is the final four players that made it to the top 64. So this is going to be the top pro players looking at the tournament meta, also just looking at the general meta decks. This is the final qualifier before Grand Open, which is happening in two weeks, uh, like first weekend of April. So looking forward to that. There's also going to be a charity tournament next weekend. So look out for that. There's going to be lots of that I'm going to be covering on my channel. I'll look through the decks there too, but let's look at the top four. I'm going to start off with this geezer down here, uh, Kanyeki Yamaro. I've not heard of before, big up. He has done a really interesting tournament only strategy. So these are not really decks you're going to want to play on ladder because he's come in with a lineup which is hard targeting Northern Realms. Now, if you're familiar with what I've been doing in the tournaments I've played in recently or the tournament, I did the exact same thing. I'm a big believer in this strategy. However, it's become quite difficult because before, Inspired Zero Alumni was the Northern Realms deck of choice. And now while that's still very popular, Stockpile Siege and also some Inspired Zero Siege but particularly stop pass siege has become very, very popular. So let's have a look how we did it. Remember, in Grand Tournaments, it's best of five. So uh, you ban one of your opponent's deck and you have to win with every deck. So if you hard target Northern Realms, if you beat Northern Realms every time in the tournament, you win the tournament. Assuming all your opponents bring Northern Realms, which they will. So let's just take a quick look at the first deck. The first deck is a Guerrilla Tactics set. No surprise there in a deck, the lineup that's targeted Northern Realms. Guerrilla Tactics, Milver, of course, being very, very good against Alumno. But again, remember, you, it's not good enough to just beat that deck. You've also got to be beating Stockpile as well. So things like Moondust and Maddox and interestingly, a couple of Waylays without the um, the Vanadane. And a key card that you're going to be seeing in a lot of these decks is Angolem because you're going to hit um, flipping Chapter of Wizards against Alumno. But now people are playing Siege. And you're not going to be able to trigger Siege in Square Tail, right? Wrong! Dwarven Chariots, shout out to Andy in the chat who pointed this out to me. Um, you can actually trigger your Siege off Angolan with the Dwarven Chariots, which is really bloody cool. Um, so yeah, that's the first deck. Epidemic as well, if you're wondering. Epidemic, yeah, Epidemic is a great card in, in lineups which hard target Northern Realms because you can deal with those alumni that come in at like 8 or 9 power off of Amphibious Assault. I guess it's 9 power, not 8. Not alumni, students. Up next, we've got Onslaught. I'm really surprised to see this one, to be honest, in the lineup. Uh, this guy, by the way, if you're interested, basically came third out of these four people. Um, yeah, basically came third. So didn't quite qualify, but got very, very, very close. It was out of 64 people, right? So he came third out of 64. So his lineup was, was really, really good. Um, Onslaught. So Devotion with Harold and Bran. This is a deck that lots of people were playing until uh, a certain streamer by the name of Specky uh, found out that non-Devotion was better. And then everyone started doing it. And yeah. Now, uh, apparently, this one's back. I never really liked this version too much myself. Um, as I, I say, I, I always push that non-devotion version. Um, you don't really have that much control to deal with uh, Siege and stuff. You do have Gutting Sashes. You have Primal Savagery. This card's really good combined with Leader to like answer some kind of engine. You've got Skiordal. That's the big payoff. A lock, but I don't know, man. I'm a little bit surprised that this lineup did so well with a devotion version of Onslaught, but fair play. Cool to see. Uh, I'm next, we've got a stockpile deck with Angolem. No surprise to see Angolem, because that's the thing, right? If you go non-devotion on sort, you get to play your Angolem. I guess there's no siege engines, though, in this faction. There's machines, but that's not going to trigger, right? You need siege engines to trigger siege. So maybe Angolem's not all that in on sort because of the siege matchup. So that's interesting. So maybe just going for a value approach is better. You lose out a muzzle, you get a Skjordal. You don't get Sunset Wanderers either. It's interesting, for sure. Uh, stockpile, anyway, next. This definitely makes a lot more sense compared to going for an alumni deck because if you go alumni, you want to go for cards like Doodoo, -doo, unironically, like Immortals and Damn Sorceress because these cards can be really good in the mirror matchups. Doodoo, -doo, if you're wondering why, you can copy something like your opponent's Vengeance or Selkirk or Gerhardt, for example, um, and that's going to be a lot of points for eight provisions. So that's like one approach you can go, like playing these cards that are uh, value in the mirror. However, against Stockpile, that's probably not going to run. So it definitely makes more sense to go for a stop deck yourself, in my opinion, uh, because you're going to be good into alumni. You've got lots of control, so alumni should struggle to deal with you. And then you just try and like set your deck up for the mirror um, with an Anglem. That means you're going to have double siege. That's already a good start, right? Like two sieges should be better than one siege, you would imagine. Nothing too like dramatic with this one, apart from the Anglem. Um, Radovid for more charges. You've got the muzzle because it's a great control tool. Lots of these decks don't play Raphael's Vengeance because you don't have that leader charge available from Stockpile to give it zeal. So yeah, uh, really cool to see Stockpile being the deck of choice in this targeting strategy. In fact, in the targeting strategy I did myself, which is only best of three, I bought three decks. I bought Guerrilla Tactics, Nilfgaard, which we're going to look at 
this guy's Nilf God deck in a second in Northern Realms. I actually bought an alumni deck that had Epidemics. And as soon as I queued it, I didn't spend long on the line up before out there. I spent like five minutes on it. Um, as soon as I queued the first game with NR, I lost. And that was my tournament over because I lost to NR. It's kind of it was, it was I was kind of done. Um, so definitely like this approach. This was ultimately though the deck that I saw him lose with in the final. He actually lost to NR with the stockpile deck. So maybe this is one that you could consider playing a different faction. Obviously no Syndicate. Which I think Syndicate's really bad into NR to be honest. Uh, and also no monsters and monsters. I mean maybe like you could try Kelly, but it seems a little bit a little bit of a stretch maybe. Maybe maybe Kelly could do something. Problem with Kelly is Sabbath is so bad against NR as well. Anyway. And save next. I really like this build. Uh, when I played my version, I used Imposter. Cams used his Imposter. Cams did this back in December at Masters. It didn't quite work out for him though. But it's still an idea I'm a big fan of. Angolam in the deck again. No surprises that you can hit Chapter of Wizards. Bear in mind with this faction in particular, uh, you can also trigger Scenario with Siege with uh, stuff like your Informants, your Q, your Terra Nova. There's not that many ways of setting up Terra Nova, but you can set up with Muzzle, with the Leader as well. Uh, as well as Furcart as well. So I really like that he's been able to fit this Terra Nova in. Typically when you see Terra Nova, you're going to be forced to also play these things like um, the Mage Torturers or the Terra Nova Turncoats in it for provisions to apply spying. But Muzzle, Leader and Furcart proving to be enough to justify the Terra Nova, which is obviously a great card. So I really like this one. That is the first lineup from the tournament. It's my favorite one. And uh, yeah, now let's look at maybe more the more typical ones, I guess, because this is a targeting lineup for a tournament. What would you guys do differently? Do you think there's anything that stands out that you think um, this guy could have done differently? Bear in mind, you can't use two decks from the same faction. So is there any monster decks or is there any uh, syndicate decks that stand out to you that you think would be good in a square, uh, in a Northern Realms target? Let me know in the comments. <gasps> Chat, that was a good start. Chat, that was good, right? Hey, hey, Mel, what's up? What's my opinion of Crystal Palace? So what the fuck did you just say, dude? Crystal Palace? Uh, what is that? Skeever went for Andy. Hey, Andy, you're popping off. Thank you so much. All right, let's look at this Donnie's return. Whoa. Okay. All right. I haven't actually looked at Skeever's lineup. He did make it through to the open. And my friend Andy here has just informed me that he went for like an anti Angolem approach because Angolem is proving very, very popular at the moment. So he didn't play Artifacts, I believe. Um, only NR, and in his NR deck, he had a little trick up his sleeve to make the Anglem worse. So that's really damn cool to see. Now, this deck looks very familiar to my friend Andy's deck, in fact, um, with the Sigfold, big, big Sig Sigfold payoff. Uh, this is going to be a blue coin deck because what you're going to do with this is you're going to try and get your Fakusha into your hand. So then you can unicorn your Melusine or Mel unicorn your Defender out in round one, milling one of your opponent's best cards, working out as a bunch of carryover. And that's why Fisher King comes in. You guys know I'm a big fan of Kishif Kishifing. I'm a big fan of the Kishifing in Skellige Discard Package in particular. Discard Package isn't in this one, but what you can do is, because you're going to go on blue coin, you could Fisher King your Fakusha, and then you could use your Mask of Boros, and then suddenly your Unicorn is able to uh, thin your Defender or thin your... Uh, Melusine while also flipping, milling your opponent's best card. Also, you're going to get like an extra point by unicorning into Melusine with the correct positioning, right? Um, so it's a really, really cool approach. I, I do, I'm, I believe I'm not mistaken in saying this is Andy that popularized this kind of approach. Um, obviously, the whole uh, Sigfold thing is something that, you know, I uh, have enjoyed doing a lot of and it's kind of a pioneer in this area, but no Truffle, no Geddy. Um, and that's it really does make a lot of sense if you're not wanting to give Angolem a lot of value, right? Um, so, yeah, this deck is something I'm definitely going to be trying out on stream. And I'll post a video on it too. Ermion is an interesting card, in my opinion. It's like an extra consistency card. I don't like Ermion, mate. I'm not going to lie. I'm not a big uh, fan of Ermion myself. Particularly when you're not playing Gedina. Um, he can chew to obviously some very important cards like Sigdrift is right, Restore, Mardrums are basically gold cards in this deck. So being having a tutor for these cards does make sense, particularly the Sigdrifter. But for me, I don't like Hermion that much, mate. I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the guy. It's not like John Natalis where you're tutoring in Echo cards, you know? So 
If I was to build this, I would probably look at like trying something different than Ermion. Interesting as well, we've got the Vilkal and the Harold Hounds now with Ursa and Ritual being the leader of choice over uh, the Battle Trance. So with Ursa and Ritual, I guess the biggest selling point is the fact that you're going to be able to get your nut down to Berserk 5 very, very consistently indeed. And that does sound flipping scary. Um, I'm also not a massive Vilkal believer, but it does give you a backup restore target too. Very interesting uh, deck. I definitely would never have built a deck that looks anything like this. So big up to Andy and the guys that played this deck and built it because it's really flipping cool. I'm uh, next. We've got Dead Eye Ambush. This is the first Elven deck we've seen. No surprises here. Actually, there is quite a few surprises in this one. Wow. Um, <laughs> there's no feign death. That's the first thing that catches the eye, and that makes sense if you're trying to make Angolan worse because obviously Angolan is going to hit you feign death. Um, if your man, if your opponent has any elves in their deck, they can then trigger it. If they're playing NG, they can trigger it. If they're playing uh, Wild Hunt, they have elves. So yeah, no, uh, no scenario again. Um, there is Waylays. There is Vanadane, of course. No surprises there. Interesting enough, there is a Nickers and a Fisher King. Bro, mate, I told you guys Fisher King was good, man. And now we're seeing Fisher King in just all these decks. Wow. I told you guys Fisher King was good, man. And everyone's like, oh, Spessy, it's only Specimen Gwen that uses Fisher King. Bro, what can I say? I'm a pioneer, man. <sighs> Bro, I'm so flipping. I'm, I've got such a big ego when it comes to deck building. It's actually not, it's not healthy. Um, we've got archers in here too. Um, instead of playing like a flipping uh, harvest. So I just overswarms. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. When I played this deck myself, I overswarms. I also really like the fact you've got Muzzle Heatwave. Plus also the Great Oak in here. Like Great Oak is banging with this leader. Muzzle Heatwave is just an ideal way to play it. No Teruvial. Teruvial is the card that's going to make way in order to fit the Muzzle and the Heatwave. Um, notice the Nick is instead of Yaven. So no Yaven at all. Wowzer. That's pretty big. And the other, like one of the biggest downsides actually about Nickers is that you, um, it bricks your commando, right? As does Alyssa. Venosio's commando being this full provision elf that you get off the scenario. But yeah, that's actually it's a very good point. So Nickers is is no joke, and I mean, cutting Yaven is controversial to say the least for a, for a Nickers and a, and a Fisher King. But uh, wow, I also just like I'm a big believer in Fisher King in a deck like this over Maxi because Maxi shuffling your deck, whereas Fisher King you just like want a top deck like you're in Nero, for example, right? Or like flipping top deck, you're Simless. Um, you don't want to shuffle with Maxi because you're bottom decking Waylays. You, you want to keep your Waylays in hand. Yeah, no commanders in this deck. I just mean like uh, in a normal version, right? Uh, with like Fain Death, for example. Like that's like a downside of a card like Nickers because Wasubi put flipping Nickers in his... Um, Wasubi put Nickers in his uh, ST deck like right at the start of the patch. I was like, bro, what are you doing? Um, you don't want to go to all have engines. That also makes a lot of sense. You have a couple, right? But nothing more than that. Um, yeah, this is a... Uh, this is really flipping cool. And again, Fisher King, again, as I say with the Waylays, you want to have the Waylays in your hand, bottom deck with them with Vanadane, and then you're not going to draw them again. So then if you go Maxi and Shuffle, suddenly you're shuffling these Waylays from the bottom to the top, innit? So Fisher King also making more sense in this deck than Maxi. Definitely worth the provision. Bro, I fucking love Fisher King, man. If that wasn't obvious. Up next, we've got a very boring Jackpot deck. It's got to be done sometimes. Um, nothing really to talk about there. Let's move on. And um, we've also got a very boring Alumni deck. However, there's something to talk about here. Um, Siege Masters still see play at five provisions, even though they got nerfed. That's insane. Uh, they did get, like, obviously a buff with the cooldown. Like, the cooldown buff they got is pretty significant. You can use it on stuff like Vengeance and Shani uh, for a lot of points. Uh, a couple of Siege Towers to help get these Siege Masters out. The inclusion of Necromancy is one I really like. This is a card that I've been singing the praises of in Northern Realms for a very long time. In fact, when my teammates uh, were prepping for Masters... Uh, Spy B and Payable, I did suggest Necromancy in Alumni decks as a card that's really good because if someone's trying to target you, it comes in particularly clutch. And maybe this is why Skiva managed to just get his NR deck through. This card is going to be so good in, in a deck that's uh, against a deck that's trying to target you. The reason is, is you can resurrect one of your Bionard students or your Aratusa students, um, essentially giving you a fifth student, kind of. But more significantly, it's also guaranteed to improve the carryover from your students. Because let's say you've got a banner student on two patients as the most in your graveyard. You necromancy that geezer out. Suddenly you've got patients free, you know. So that's uh, pretty damn cool. Uh, the other thing that's worth noticing in this deck is this random Omega Scope. Um, it's the only 
deck that he has in his lineup with a scenario or an artifact, and that is going to be Chapter of Wizards. So by including the Megascope, 50% of the time, Angolem is now going to be hitting a Megascope instead of a Chapter of Wizards. That's going to make things significantly more likely for you to be able to get your NR deck through. Again, I didn't watch the final game, but I do know he did manage to get this through um, against uh, the Stop Hard deck we looked at before. Maybe this Necromancy, maybe this Megascope, which is the, the difference that was needed in that matchup. All right, let's move on and look at the other two lineups. Is this a good video? I think it's pretty good. I'd watch it. Bro, Lirio had flipping fruits. Who got through? Magpie. Bro, should have checked. Alright guys, third person is Lirio. Uh, big up Lirio. We've seen this deck already. So clearly it's pop popping off. It looks exactly the same if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we've got an NR deck which also looks exactly the same as Skeevers. With a Necromancy Megascope. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> there's a flipping fruits deck. So guys, I'm going to definitely play this deck uh, on stream. And I'll upload a video on it. It's a Relics Fruit deck. I've got it in Polish at the moment, if you uh, don't mind. Mamuna here. <laughs> so, a couple of Megascopes. There's not many 4s, as there often is often the case in Relic decks. There's often so many 5s you want to play. Squirrel, Double Lesser Witch, Megascopes. Uh, Megascopes, obviously, really nice on Griffins, even on Self Eaters. Uh, got a couple of a couple of Incubus, a couple of Griffins. Um, these are cards I try and personally avoid, but in Fruits, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mate, there's a couple of... There's an offering as well. Now, this is a card I'm a big flipping fan of, mate. In fruits, in particular. Because you can just use it on your own fruit. Uh, damn. Very cool, mate. You can also use it offensively if you're able to sign it up, uh, line it up. That's unlikely. You've got Dorogray for a little bit of lock control. No defender in here, so you're not overloading Purify. So I'm a little bit surprised to see the Dorogray. Uh, there's an Operator... Operator is going to be used predominantly on self eaters, and you can incubus your self eaters out uh, because your opponent's going to have then a sixth provision card in their graveyard. Uh, Operator, I guess, could also. It's also not that bad on Lesser Witch because it gives you the bonded, but yeah, predominantly it's going to be on on self eater. That's also where Curse Scroll is going to come in. You're going to try and use Curse Scroll to set up in round one. There's also uh, no no royal decree. Flip in hell. <laughs> no royal decree. My God. Uh, <laughs> there's a rat catcher s there's a giant toad a unicorn which is gonna mill your she who knows uh while milling your opponent's best card uh it's got a mushy truffle into the uh rat catcher s lady thingamajiggers lesser witches mamuna gurney as well a uh, very very cool i'm gonna play this deck myself finally last but certainly not least we've got a saskia dead eye ambush deck okay this is something that i have seen before i've never actually seen a new player but a friend of mine named Gravesh also had this deck built um, last week for the top 16 as an idea, but uh, ended up not going for it. He wasn't playing in it, but like he was helping uh, Spyro, for example, go for it. Yeah, Crax is the tutor in it, right? Crax is a tutor. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. You need points, man. Like it's a it's an archetype that struggles, right? So just draw your cards, and you have Curse Scroll. Uh, does he play it going first? Does anybody know? You can come that out. But anyway, uh, it's a Saskia instead of Fain Death. Now, we've talked about Fain Death already. Andy mentioned it. It does help. It does overswarm a bit. Uh, you're also giving Heat Wave value, which otherwise Heat Wave is really struggling against this deck. It's going to play for like five points or so. I guess six points on Vanadane, six points plus on Vanadane. Um, so, including Saskia is really interesting. Going for the movement package with the Elves, the Witches, and the Matrons. Also, interesting to point out, this is like. Kind of reminiscent of Freddy Babe's Masters deck from Masters 1, which uh, I did help build, just in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> just to throw it out there. I don't take too much credit for that one, though. That was a Freddy Babe's and Green Knight idea. I just helped refine it a wee bit. Um, yeah, looks really cool. Teruvial does make the cut here. Uh, there's no muzzle in this one, then. So basically, uh, Feigned Death being replaced by Saskia. Um, Teruvial versus muzzle is like the usual like big decision. There's a Yaven instead of the Knickers and Fisher King. There's a Rebuke. As well to just fill this provision i would imagine if there was like one more provision you maybe play muzzle instead of teruvial and then just downgrade this uh this card but it's very difficult to cut yaven to be fair so i really like this this deck actually it's another one that i will try out and finally last but certainly last we've got magpie magpie always brings some spice here's leader please don't look that spicy though i'm gonna throw it out the leader abilities ain't looking too spicy here 
Uh, first and foremost, we've got Off the Books. Off the Books, this is another deck I do need to try. It's using a lot of the four provision Fire Swan cards, which got buffed, like this guy. He's now Fee 1. Uh, we've got also this guy, who's like an eight point card. Uh, furthermore, the this guy, <laughs> not very good with their names, apparently. He's pretty good now. He's a tribute card. Uh, also, you can spend uh, one coin to give, turn a Zealot into a the free power guy with one armor, which also gives you an extra point on this geezer. Bro, the names are not popping off. Uh, this is where I actually need to change to English, but I'm too stubborn, man. You've also got Ewald and Horst. Uh, Geller is also great in this deck because you do get quite a lot of swarm with your Fire Swarm geezers. Uh, there's a Tin Boy too, which is really cool to see. Uh, Tin Boy, of course, also being a tribute card. Um, which can contribute towards your King of Beggars. Uh, up next, this is obviously the Tin Boy is going to be good into Elves as well. Uh, up next, there's a double cross deck with an Angerland. There's a Diviner instead of Pella, uh, which I like. Basically, you could play a Pella um, and then instead of this, and then upgrade one of these fours like to a five tactic, for example. Like you could change a Major Infiltrator to a second. Uh, novice but yeah going for the, the diviner I, I, I think is worth in this case because you just have like one provision there's not really much else you want to do with it uh, angle is the card of choice very important to note you're going for angle while including a bonded card and also you, you've got angle with no truffle yourself if you're playing angle and a truffle in the same deck shh, it's going to go a little bit pear shaped because against Nilfgaard they're going to cool your angle that's not what you want to happen uh, we've also got a elf deck with a feign death this is a way more typical version uh, with Teruvial instead of Muzzle, with a Maxi. There's Rebuke plus Archers uh, instead of Harvest. I think Harvests are a better way to go than Archers, unless you're going to ban Nilfgaard. Like, these Archers are so bad against Nilfgaard. Um, also interesting to see double Neophyte. It's not a card you see every day. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have got a Stockpile Siege deck uh, with the Muzzle, with the Heatwave and Radovid up at the top. A War Chariot, Faultless Pride, couple of boiling ores which i love to see a couple of bombardments which i love to see and a couple of winches if i was going to play a siege deck i would make a real effort to play two oils two winches two bombardments because the warfare cards just pop off with so many cooldown uh, uh respy cards all right that is the decks and the lineups from the top four here was how the bracket looked out uh, magpie coming out in the winner's bracket and skiva coming out in the loser's bracket so gt to all these guys obviously they made it super far um yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this little breakdown of the tournament top four meta. Lots of very surprising and interesting decks. So big up to all these guys bringing unique decks. Uh, really, really cool to see. Looking forward to going open in a couple weeks. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked it, let me know and see you in the next one.